Welcome to the Justice in Heels podcast. I'm your host, Danielle Hayward, and I'm thrilled to have you join us for season two. In this season, we focus on sharing stories and exploring strategies that empower those in the legal field to not just survive, but thrive in their careers. So, whether you're a seasoned lawyer, a fresh graduate navigating the legal landscape, or just someone curious about the world of law, Season 2 of this podcast is your go-to source for inspiration and support. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Justice in Heels podcast. Today we are going to be speaking about the topic of mentorship and then bullying in law firms. So joining me today, I have the infamous Lisa Veline Thomas. Lisa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Danielle, for having me. It's been a long time coming, and I'm finally glad to be having this conversation. So before we start, um, can you just tell us a bit more about yourself? Tell us a bit about your podcast that you have. Okay, so... I, I've been, well, I only became infamous, as you say, hopefully for the right reasons. <laughs> um, I only became infamous or famous when I started to use LinkedIn properly. Um, but my background is obviously in the legal profession. I'm a advocate by profession, a barrister for those that are in the UK. Um, and yeah, I, I worked that, for, I mean, obviously a law student, and then practiced, did my pupillage, practiced for a year and a half, left that, had a bit of a wilderness period. And then I eventually got into two law firms. And then I resigned from the last one in February of 2020, which is the year we, we had COVID. And then, you know, March, we went into here in South Africa, we went into a hard lockdown. So from March onwards, I was basically, I started to, Obviously, we were all indoors, online. So I decided to start, you know, I started to feel sorry for law students, especially with classes going online. And so I started to be a bit like more of an agony aunt. Like I wanted to know that I'm there for them and stuff like that. And then I was doing everything from CV renovations to just general questions. And it just sort of built up from there. Um, and also that was a time when I discovered what I feel is my true um, professional interest, which is dispute resolution, mediation. So at that time, I was also making connections internationally and, you know, getting into that space. Um, and then so I was sort of doing the two simultaneously. And then I started to build up my student database. And I discovered that they need mentorship. And but obviously with the salary being what they are in South Africa for the candidate attorneys, they were not able to pay for it. So I kind of did a survey and then I sat on the idea for about two years. And then in the meantime, also, I was starting to just play around, but not even hoping to become a content creator. But I was just trying to, I guess, provide explanations, provide a bridge between law, university and legal practice. So very you know, the 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 international scenario, the, the international problem is that there's no, you know, people students find it hard to translate from university to to applying their knowledge in in practice. So I was starting to provide content like that that if people needed a refresher, you know, if they were at a law firm, they were stuck on something, they were a candidate attorney or they were junior, they, they would find my post and say, wow, I was asked, just asking this question and there she answered it. So that's how my content evolved. And obviously I, I took feedback and I listened to my people that were following me. And then I started to create the PDFs, um, which I did that because, mainly because I discovered people were screenshotting my posts. So I said, let me make it easy for them to download. So I started to, so the format has evolved according to needs and according to, I think just having quick takeaways. And of course, lots of things have, spur, have, have, have come out of the content itself, um, one of which being my academy, which is maybe about a year, year and a half old. Um, and I have no background in legal education. It's just I discovered that 
contrary to what, you know, or, or I've been running away from the teacher cap. Um, my parents tried to put that on me, but I ran away from it early on in life. But I had to embrace the fact that, okay, now I'm a, I'm a legal, I'm a teacher of legal stuff. So my academy started and then I saw, I launched my mentorship thing, which was, uh, I decided to make it free of charge um, for those that can't afford it. And then things have just gone from there. Like you mentioned, I've got the podcast Lawyers with Stories on Spotify um, and many things. I think just listening to the audience and, you know, scrolling. When I scroll, it's most, I mean, I'm just looking for people to help basically. So a lot of things have evolved from there, um, which I actually had to make a list of because I would forget. Um, so, I mean, I, I said I had the academy, private mentorship, um, coaching, professional coaching, virtual volunteer project, which is v affectionately known as VVP, um, which evolved out of content um, and, and being on LinkedIn and seeing how people need legal experience you know and they're not getting in anywhere let you not know, for experience let alone earning a decent living so i created the vvp to meet that need um and then as you know candidate chinese here face uh, almost not an uphill they face a vertical battle every day it's like almost insurmountable so i decided to get into advocacy so i created the ca support group which started off as a whatsapp group mainly geared towards mental health because I was very concerned uh, looking at, again, scrolling, looking at how despondent they are, how fearful they are to even say anything. So I said, let me just have a WhatsApp group where they can just at least come somewhere and rant, you know, even if nobody gives them yeah. any advice, just to get it off their chest because you carry that around with you day in, day out. It's just, it makes you sick to put it bluntly, right? So that's how it started, the CA support group. And then it's, again, something else that's, that has evolved and has now become the CA advocacy group. And uh, it's more than mental health, but of course, mental health generally underpins most of what I do. Um, because if you have, you know, if you have an outlet, if you have resources, you are well, right? And so, um, so now I've got the advocacy group trying to get off the ground. And I, I'm I'm crazy. I start things and I I I'm a pioneer. So I don't work out the details. <laughs> I just start something because I see the need. I start it and then, you know, hopefully I can achieve something through it. Even if I just start start it and somebody else takes up the baton. And then of course recently I launched uh because I'm involved in mediation internationally, um you know, with other professionals overseas. I decided to launch a mentorship group, especially for those that have problem solving skills, but don't necessarily see it working in the courtroom. But I think those people tend to be marginalized. And so we sort of force ourselves, we get into the courtroom because that's what the system accommodates and it supports, right? But I'm sure that there are people that are just superb conflict resolvers in their families amongst their peers so i've that's my 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 more recent project the problem solvers mentorship group which i advertised today on linkedin by the way um and then i've also launched uh career crossroads Res resolution services it's the first time i'm saying it out loud <laughs> got a bit tongue tied there um which is again kind of blending some of my passions so it's 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 specific geared towards those that find their career legal career or thoughts of a legal career causing conflict between loved ones right so that mediation it's a mediation service essentially but it's it's sort of um, geared at bringing people to the table and um which I will and I'll advertise that on LinkedIn tomorrow you'll see the post go up so those are my two latest crazy projects which again trying to meet a need, trying to provide an outlet and to create resources. Um, and I, it's just me behind the computer, okay? So it's me behind the, I don't have staff. I don't even use volunteers, my volunteer project to do any of my work for me. So it does get pretty crazy. I have to have a very um, good time management system and 
uh, you know, priority management and uh, to-do list and reminders on my phone and all of those things. So yeah, it does get crazy, but I think what wakes me up every day is knowing that I can help somebody, you know, even if it's just, uh, you know, two lines in a DM that I reply to on LinkedIn. I mean, I've had so many of those say, oh, you made my day or thank you for thinking of me or thank you for responding. So it's tiring and I have had to learn to take care of myself. Um, got my fingers burned, got myself close to capacity, but now I'm dialing that back, trying to put some things in place. Because I find that the more, the busier I get, but the busier one gets, the more demand there is for self-care. Otherwise, you're not going to be available um, to do all the things that you set out to do. So if I'm going to be available and start all of these projects and make them work, then of course I have to make sure that I'm in good shape mentally and physically. I haven't started yet. <laughs> Getting but, there, one yeah, step at a time. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I think for me, I just prioritize movement and getting out into the sunshine or outside. Um, but yeah, so I and of course I can't practice preach what I don't practice. So. If I'm taking care of the mental health of all of these aspiring professional legal professionals and juniors, then I have to take care of myself. So that's something that I also try my best to do behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, that's my that's the short version of this story. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, sure, yeah. So you've shared a lot now, but I just want to say, like, I love how you call yourself, like, law mom. Like, you end <laughs> all of your posts with law mom. Because that's essentially what you are. You're basically, like, a motherly figure to all of the candidate attorneys, young attorneys, law students. Um, mm. Yeah. And, I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. So, it's, sorry, it's, you wanted uh, to say? I, I am looking to trademark that. I was looking to trademark oh. that. So... Um, when I get a bit richer, then I will look into trademarking all of these things. Um, and you need to, it's so unique. Yeah. Branding. So for, for me, I know I've also had to learn about personal branding and things like that. So it's been a learning on the job crash course type of thing, but yeah, we all need an, we need an auntie in the, in the, in the furniture business, you know, that Joshua Dor <laughs> advert. So Kind of, I see myself like that, you know. So it's someone that's always there to call, call on. Amazing. So let's get into the first topic for today, which is mentorship. So mm. can you firstly just tell us, um, like, did you have, did you have a mentor? Do you have one now? And like, how has it affected your life? I didn't. In fact, I think perhaps when you were also coming up, this wasn't as much the, the the rage as it is now um so no apart from the lecturers at university maybe the tutors in our tutorial sessions were a little bit like mentors because they were still students but no nothing not, i mean i didn't have anyone that i could like tap into and say you know what does this mean or give me some perspective from the outside so no i didn't have that um I guess when I did my pupillage, they called like the person that we were shadowing, they called that a mentor advocate. But again, in terms of what a mentorship is meant to do for you, it was just basically a job shadowing. So no, uh, strictly speaking, I didn't have um, a mentor. I am actually looking into getting one now. Um, <laughs> you know, someone just, just even if it's like a check-in buddy, someone just to like a sounding board, even if it's not a professional coaching relationship, because I feel like there's a lot of demand, as I said, um, the more you put yourself out, the more helpful you are, the more demand, you know, people are drawing from you all the time. So I feel even in terms of my own mental health, like just to have, I've been thinking recently of getting my own more coach, um, a co coach type of relationship, because uh, I think, and they say everyone needs a therapist. I guess it's it's something like that. Like you just need a sounding board and it's someone exciting. to tell you you're not crazy, you're not crazy, and it's okay to pull back. Because sometimes you can feel like you need to save the whole world, um, which sometimes I can get, I can borderline get into that mode, and then I feel like 
I have to give answers for everything. And then I have to pull myself back and say, no, you don't. So I just, I just feel like I, if I can have someone on the, you know, someone else outside of myself to have those conversations with, um, I would certainly welcome having, having a mentor, having a, a coach. Okay. So you actually raised a very interesting point now. What would you then say is the difference between someone who's your employer or your principal and somebody who's actually like mentoring you? I think, and I think this, I think employers now with the whole mental health, you know, dialogue, and I think they've had to sort of become maybe, um, and most of them aren't cut out for that, you know, so you can't, at the end of the day, you are driving profits, you are, you know, there are other interests that, you know, override your employees' well-being. So, and, you know, even if you have the best of intentions uh, to look after your employees, so the system is is what it is. It's cruel. And you have commercial interests that are driving your activities at the end of the day. So I I think mentorship is different in that a mentor really has the, the other person's well-being paramount. So even in the ones that I do, I always stress at the outset uh, that number one, well, they have to make it work. If they have signed up, they, ha they are responsible for making it work. But as a mentor, I am not here to hold you back, you know? And I even welcome what they call reverse mentoring, which is where you learn from your mentees. So I, you can also be mentored as a mentee in that in a, in a two-way relationship. So it's also another dynamic that mentorship is two-way. So it's not you, you as the mentor sitting and, you know, monologuing. I hate those kinds of sessions where, you know, and I am in a position where people just receive what I have to say, which is, which is not wrong. But at the same time, you know, you can also teach me a thing or two so I think in an employment situation, that will not be welcome. It'll probably be seen as insubordination. Or, um, so I think it's just priorities that are ordered differently in an employer-employee relationship. An employee can be an employer can become your mentor, but I think it's always advisable to have a mentorship relationship outside of the employment simply because there's there's a conflict of interest, um, and your employer is driven by even your manager might not be your employer directly, but they're just driven by different things. And, and also if you have some on the outside, then it's, it's, they can give you perspective rather than everything being in-house and it's sort of being compromised or tainted by the business itself. Yeah. Makes sense. And I mean, like even having a mentor outside of the, like the law, you know, yeah. like maybe having somebody who is not primarily in law, but maybe somebody who's older than you, who also has a lot of experience, who can also mm -hmm. teach you a bit mm -hmm. more about other things like personal branding, for example, or communication. Um, so yeah. I think like mentorship is a lot of people think that you need to have a mentor in the legal field. Obviously, it's great to have one in the legal field, but even if you have more than one mentor, mm -hmm. that's also great. Do you agree with yeah. that? Yeah, fully. Uh, in fact, I I would encourage people who even can't find a mentor in the legal profession. And let's be honest, it's it's rare. It's yeah, extremely maybe. rare. I mean, you probably will have, you know, sort of these pro there are programs, I mean, not to discount what's happening, but for like one on one professional for a, a, a professional person to reach out or to offer the services is doesn't happen. It doesn't happen as often as we would like. So I I think somebody outside the legal field, but obviously in the working world, will give you a, a whole lot more perspective because I think we can be a tad myopic in the legal profession and think that certain dynamics only exist in our field and but if someone who's maybe been employed in different fields, maybe has studied multiple degrees, you know, they've been around, they've literally been around the block. 
So, and of course, it can be a family member. It can be, you know, uh, somebody at church. It can be, it's anybody that you trust basically to adjust you or to give you perspective. So it's a, it's a trust relationship and you must be able to trust that, again, going back to the well-being part, that that person has your best interests. So whatever they're telling you, even if they're telling you you're doing something wrong, or you need to adjust something, you can accept it because you know that it's coming from a good place. So that can be anybody. It can be your partner. It can be, you know, a family member, a grandparent, just somebody that's over you and, and you know, with some life experience at the bare minimum. That, that's what we need. Sometimes we just need someone to just tell us, you know, this, that's the way life is, or I went through that. And even my mentorship extends beyond, I tell people, it can extend to as many areas as you want it. Even, although it's not therapy and I'm not a mental health professional, but in as many areas as you need help and as I have wisdom to share, I will help you. So even my mentorship is not limited to legal stuff. Of course, if they want to keep it to the legal field, that's that's fine. But it's open to relationships, anything, anything that I've had experience in. I will share the wisdom that I've ga I've gained, and of course, also share what I haven't worked out yet, which I think is uh, vulnerability is very important as a mentor, also. Amazing. So, in saying that, um, how would you recommend somebody look for a mentor? Like, what qualities should you look for? Where can you find a mentor? All of that. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I I wish that there was some kind of a gold mine where we could just go and dig and dig and dig and find. Uh, the, sad, the sad reality, at least in the legal profession, is that lawyers are more concerned and law firms are more concerned with PR. So if you take LinkedIn, for example, everything is good. Okay, it's, we're winning cases. We're showing off our latest branch. We're showing off our VAC work program. And so what happens is that you can start to admire certain firms or maybe certain directors of certain firms or even the partners or the associates. Um, and that's not a true picture. And so you can have, it, it definitely creates false perceptions of what it takes to be a successful lawyer. And if, I think yesterday I put up a post about, about networking and I said, you know, reach out to those that resonate with who you are, as opposed to just being successful or appearing successful, because there's a lot of that in the legal space, in the South African legal space in on LinkedIn. I'll speak to South Africa only. Um, there's a lot of success and succeeding against the odds. And, you know, so you have this false image, number one. And of course, sometimes you think, oh, this person is just like me. Let me reach out. And you find out they actually don't want to talk to you. So like their stories are not like my sort of mantra when it comes to uh, being, I think my reason for existing is that my entire life is meant to be a resource. So hence I'm very relational, very responsive, very solution driven, very pioneering. Um, if something doesn't exist, I'll try to create it basically. But sometimes you will have people like that who maybe post about difficulties, post about how they came through adversity and you say, wow, I need this person to mentor me. And you DM them or you send them an email and you find that they're very, very standoffish in real life. So it's a whole idea of, do they want to share their journey? Do they want to share how they've come through? And of course, tell you how you can do it better. And I think that's where the real question lies. Um, because, I mean, like I said at the outset, mentorship is a buzzword. But as I've come to learn in my own experience, and my mentorship uh, pro platform has gone through various iterations, uh, people don't understand what mentorship is from a mentee's perspective. And then for certain professionals, they will jump on the bandwagon. Right. And they just to sound, make the right noises to say, oh, look, my law firm has a mentorship or uh, we have a mentorship initiative or, you know, we have a networking event where law students can come. And it's it's not authentic. It's not genuine. It doesn't 
look to meet the needs of the people that they are saying that they want to help. So I think it's 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 not it's not an easy it's not easy to find someone because even if you find someone that you think you've been maybe been following them on social media and if you think that they are candidates and I've done a post about how to approach your mentor, you got to be prepared for them to say no because most of them will say no. And you've got to have a heart for it. You've got to want to share your story, share your life. Um, and you have to make time for people. And I think in my own experience, above the many things they appreciate about my, you know, my contribution is the fact that I make time for them. So whether it's responding to a DM on LinkedIn or a comment or an email, or even set, having free mentorship sessions with them. Most of the sessions are free because most of them can't afford it. The time is what they value. And I think a lot of legal professionals are too caught up chasing the wrong things um, that they fail to see the sort of the, the sea of drowning aspiring people that want to be, probably want to be where they are, but they don't throw anything. They don't throw a, a, a lifeline. They don't throw a lifesaver, nothing. So it's like they're just expecting the profession to carry on, but they're not helping those that want to get, come up, you know, come up. So I think it's, 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 there's no silver bullet when it comes to finding a mentor. The best you can do is identify certain people, like I said, that resonate with who you are and who you want to be as a legal professional. Again, coming down to personal branding, who you want to be, uh, what kind of lawyer do you want to be? And who who are you? So if you find people, you can narrow it down, I think, using those filters. And then just ask. you got to ask. Um, and as I said, be prepared for them to say no, because most of them say no. And if those people bomb out, then of course, I'm I'm real. <laughs> Fascinating perspective. And I think a lot of like very good advice that you just gave us. Um, but okay, so let's say somebody now found their mentor, um, like this whole mentor-mentee relationship has started, but now mm -hmm. the mentee realizes that the mentor is actually like, I don't want to say not who they thought they were, but maybe like it's just not suitable. Like they just don't click or something, mm -hmm. they're just unhappy about something and now they want to get a new mentor how mm -hmm. would you suggest suggest they approach this um well i haven't had people be that way with me i think i've been and i posted about it a couple of times i've 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 been more stood up and ghosted than people saying i'm not comfortable with you which is actually not cool and it's much it's more preferable for them to say to communicate to say I, I don't want yeah. or I, it's not what I thought it was uh I, I I don't feel that I click with you or I don't like where it's going so that that's actually preferable that but I've been I'm not not had people I don't think I don't can't remember right now maybe they have been but I, most people have either stood me up not pitched up for sessions and or just ghosted me whenever I've tried to reach out to them so but I think from a mentee's from a mentee's perspective, it's always helpful to communicate because I think the thing that frustrates me the most is that I I make proper arrangements. I have a, like I said, I do everything myself. I have ten thousand inboxes that I have to see to every day, um, and I reply. I make the proper arrangements. I set up. I send them the links. I do everything I can from my end. So. The least you can do is obviously say it's, it's not working out. And I think it also depends on the mentor themselves. Like some people will get offended. I think the majority of people will get offended, um, especially in the legal profession because the egos are like unhealthily huge, yeah. right? So they'll say, oh, I took the time out and now you don't want to come. Please don't waste my time. They'll get angry. 
even if they were to be told. But I think telling a, ment a mentor very politely, you know, and I guess you can be as explicit or implicit as you want, but I think honesty is very important. If it's, yeah. if, if it's not working, and of course, I've, I've, I had somebody that, do me a mentorship guide or just to say what it is what it's not and I send that out when people approach me or they uh, contact me to join then I'll I give them the document to read through first and then I make the arrangement so they have an understanding of what it is and what it's not so I think that's also important for the mentor to establish at the outset what mentorship is I've like I said my mentorship has gone through various iterations and <laughs> at one point it seemed like people understood mentorship to be me giving them tuition and me providing mm -hmm. exam exam answers. And I realized, wait, the, this there's some cross lines here. There's some mis and oh, and of course, just belonging because my name is attached to it. Because it's it's not something that I it's not something that's fashion. I don't do it to be fashionable. So I think it's just it, if after setting up the, the the expectations and everyone is clear, if the mentee is still is still uncomfortable for whatever reason, and look, I mentor both genders, okay, and say for one incident with a male, an older male, um, I, I haven't had any, you know, um, complaints or or even from a mentee's side where the mentee has behaved inappropriately. In fact, I will more often than not shoot them an email to tell them what wasn't cool, right? Yeah. And then maybe give them a second chance or something like that. Um, but this obviously this one instance, it was borderline sexual harassment. <laughs> oh, it was no. really creepy. Um, uh, and I had to bring that one to an end. So from my end, you know, I had to, and I mean, he knew what he was doing, but for some reason he thought it was okay to continue. So appropriate. Yeah. So look, the thing is, as a, as a mentor, if what I think I'm doing is not what you are receiving, then we have to talk, right? Yeah. So if, if what you are getting out of it is not what I'm thinking you're getting out of it, which is guidance, mentorship, adjustment, inspiration, all of those things, then there are some crossed wires and we have to talk about it because there's no point there's no point me pitching up every week or twice a month and giving you something. And for you it represents something to completely different on your end, you know? Then mm -hmm. we're not the, the thing is not an, on an equal footing. So in that in my from my perspective, I would certainly communicate that. I'll say, hey, if you are wanting that and I am giving you this, I don't think it's aligned. And I think if, from a mentee's perspective as well, if they are, provided they are polite, because I've had, I mean, I'll be blunt. Law students here are very disrespectful. Um, and I, at, at the risk of being disrespected, I extend myself. So I think I call it an occupational hazard to receive disrespect like that. But I think if if mentees communicate politely and maybe they preface it with something positive, um, they can send an email, I guess, um, or they can have a phone call or whatever the medium they choose. But just let the men mentor okay. know politely mm -hmm. why it's not working out. And I think also what might help with us is setting a timeline or a time frame for the mentorship. So say after, so maybe you say after two months, we're going to evaluate. So at the evaluation, maybe they can say uh, it's not working out for X, Y, and Z. And then from, from my perspective as a mentor, I would try to troubleshoot that with them. I don't want them to be, you know, throw them to the wind or throw them to dogs. So I would try to troubleshoot them say, okay, how can we adjust it? How can we make it work? Um, did you like to change the format, the frequency, the content? So I would try a lot from my end as a mentor to make it work for them. But of course, if it's not possible, then, you know, we, we part on the best terms possible. So yeah, no from my feelings. perspective, no hard feelings. I mean, I, let, I would troubleshoot and if they still want to go, I would not be offended. 
Um, I just think the way that they communicate, it has to be respectful and polite and, you know, be specific also, be honest. Don't say, as I, something I get with another project that I'm busy with, they'll say, suddenly they'll be, oh, it's clashing with my schedule, but they, they would have been fine up until that point. So I don't like vague, just be honest, because I yeah. shoot straight as a person. So I expect people to shoot straight back to me. I can take it, okay? End of the day, mentorship is voluntary. So if you're choosing to kick against the goats and if, and most of the time, generally speaking, not the mentorship specifically, they run away because they get offended and because I hold them to account and I start to get into the difficult stuff. So then they would, suddenly there'll be a clash with the schedule and they'll be gone, mm -hmm. you know? So be specific. Don't say things like that. If I always tell people, if you have a problem with me, <laughs> say you have a problem with me. If you find my personality too strong, say that. Okay, so I think it's politeness, specific, and of course, you know, just being appreciative of whatever was achieved in the relationship up until that point, if any. Okay, so just to summarize what you said, basically, before you enter into this mentorship agreement, Make sure that you know what you want out of this mentorship and the mentor is also aligned with what you want and what yeah. they are able to provide. And secondly, especially if the mentorship is free, um, you know, at least attend the sessions or let the person know, listen, I'm not going to attend, don't ghost them. I know like I've mentored a few um, like, law students like BCom law BA law or first year mm -hmm. LB students and a lot of them will like literally harass me so much to help them then we make a plan to meet up or we will have like a zoom meeting and then they just mm -hmm. don't you know attend or like two yeah. hours later they'll be like oh yeah sorry something came up but you didn't let me know like I mean it's yeah. just common courtesy and especially yeah. I think in the legal field communication is so important yeah. So important. So is there anything else that you want to add to this uh, topic before we move on? Yeah, I just want to pick up on what you said about, you know, the, harass the harassment or they, or they have, <laughs> and I'll be very candid about South African law students again. When they want something, they want something. So there's a lot of entitlement. And then you've got to bend over backwards, but it's okay for them to forget. And whenever I see that, I always keep the bigger picture in mind. Maybe it's going to be an encouragement for you. Is that it's going to affect them later. So if you do not, that's why even in my volunteer project, I teach them time management. I have a specific session with them where I go through time management tools, why it's important. Because if you don't diarize a session, if you don't diarize your life, if you don't diarize your court cases, your filing dates, all of that, you're going to lose money. You're going to lose relationships. So I used to get very offended in the past, but now I say, well, hashtag future lawyer. Let's see how not having a system, a diary system works for you when you get into the field. And of course, if you can't keep an appointment when somebody is willingly giving you their time, see what happens when you don't keep an appointment with where it costs money, where it's going to cost you to miss that appointment or to be late for a client meeting them at court or consulting with them at the office and see how that works out for you. So I often project into the future and I will sort of follow up with them for a few weeks, maybe or maybe for like a week or maybe two. And then I take it out of my calendar because at the end of the day, and I posted a few times about this, no one's entitled to anything that I offer. And if you, you are engaging me, which is most, if not all of what I do, all of my services, be it paid or, or, or free, you come to me, I advertise it, you say, Lisa, I'm interested. So it's a voluntary thing. I don't hold a gun to anyone's head. So if they don't keep their end of the bargain, I don't chase. 
I just let them go. So there's also that side as well. Mentorship, yeah. But like we said, we establish expectations and goals at the outset so that we know where we're going. with This is not just that Danielle's always going to be available or she'll just sit there waiting for me or Lisa will just sit there waiting for me. I'll just pitch up and I want to pitch up. And I, I have no problem sort of cutting them off in terms of taking them off my calendar. When you remember, then you come back and apologize. Uh, but of course, nobody, no one's entitled to be mentored. And of course, no one is to be mentored because it's all the rage. You'll be mentored because you want to grow. And if you don't want to grow, if growth is not important to you, if respecting other people's time is not important to you, then that's on you. So that's just, I think, the flip side or the dark side of, of mentorship is that that can happen. But and we need to know as mentors how to let how to let them go. And of course, if they want to come back, then of course, like any relationship, they've got to earn your trust. They've got to, you know, they've got to make their penance. They've got to do the time and, you know, show that they are serious. But we are we don't open ourselves out as abuse, uh, as uh, as mentors to abuse by mentees who feel that our services are on tap. And we don't have anything else to do. So, amazing advice. Thank you so much, so much for sharing that. Um. Okay. So next topic, which is bullying in South Africa, and yeah. can you perhaps just like tell us some of the stories that you've heard or, or that you've read about where CAs were bullied or young attorneys were bullied by the principals or other senior staff in law firms. Too many. And it's not it's not specific to age or skin color or nothing. It's just it's just the way I, I, I'm I'm always zooming out. So I never ever address anything, you know, on a case by case basis. As much as I make the person feel hurt, I often say your story is not unique but it breaks my heart to hear it happening to one more person. Um, and I just have to zoom out. And, and from what, from my, in my personal opinion, the entire system is narcissistic, right? So we have all of these people that are putting on a charade, sort of masquerading, they're hiding behind the identity of a legal professional, but they probably had stuff done to them when they were coming up or maybe in their growing up, their whole psychology is messed up. So they feel it their their way of survival is to pay it forward. And unfortunately, we have our hapless graduates going into that shark tank. Um they don't stand it, they don't stand a chance because they're going from it's like going from daycare to big school. It's like you're going from a very nurturing, protected controlled environment to that, to a place where expectations are through the roof in, uh, in terms of what they, what they want you to do and what they think you can do. And then when you can't measure up according to that, then you get, you know, gaslit and all those lovely things that are part of narcissism in general, you know, um, and my my advice to law students generally, or even yeah, to graduates is just to take the power back. Um, because I find even with career progression too, it's like they come to the end, and when it's time to apply for article, they discover the system not on their side, and it's because they've given everything away. They trusted the system to progress them. They thought the system had their best interests, and then so when they come into a internship or practical vocational training situation, they have this implicit trust that the law firm is gonna look after them. The law firm is gonna teach them. The someone's gonna be there to answer all their questions and they have a ton of questions. The same questions you and I had, right? And I think that's what makes me, I guess, loved is that I answer those questions as if I'm answering them for the first time if I'm seeing them for the first time. And that's that's because I have a lot of empathy. But 
as you know, empathy and narcissism are polar opposites. So they go into the environment thinking, oh, my principal will understand, the secretary will understand. Um, and so they, they sort of just, again, throw themselves at the mercy of that, of that context. And then they discover, well, I can't even ask a question or I wasn't told what to do and now I'm getting, you know, ripped on because I didn't do it right. Like, is it me? Am I supposed to know these things? Maybe I should have known these things. And then you, they go into the whole hamster wheel or they gaslight themselves, would have, could have, should have. Maybe if I did this right, I wouldn't have gotten the scolding. And so it's that situation. And I think a lot of our colleagues, majority of them would rather turn a blind eye. And the thing is, I can't address the situation because I always feel like older people need to address their age group. And the, the, the reality is not happening. So at the outset, even when I started to talk about the realities of being in a law firm and the, the abuse that was going on, I had to give them coping skills. I had to give them, okay, so what do you do when your principal says this? Or here are five ways to receive feedback from your principal, right? Or here are, uh, here's, a, here's a few ways to be, how to, or how to be emotionally intelligent as a CA. I just started to bring out all those things because they had they have they had to survive. And a lot of them are in survival mode. So I think and and of course our colleagues don't also do this. They they don't they don't think back to when they were young and stupid, wet behind the ears. Like all of them came out of university and they had swallowed the commentaries and they just knew what to do. So sometimes you'll see a lot of my my very early posts, maybe like two years ago, very dry, sarcastic, because I had a lot of things to say to them. But I said, oh, okay, so then you just, you guys, oh, you guys knew it then. Like, if you're expecting them to know it, that means you came into your articles, you knew everything, you knew the commentaries, you knew the rules, you knew how the court system worked. So, I mean, of course, then these these ones have to know it as well. You know, I, I I just was very angry, very sarcastic um, toward them in my posts. And it's just that lack of empathy. And it, it 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 sort of, obviously it eats away and it makes, in some cases, even generally with narcissism, they say it can either breed an empath or it can make you a narcissist to survive in that environment. And I had a call with a CA uh, two, about two weeks ago and she's like, Basically, they want her to be like them. And I said, but you're not like that. I said, you know what you have to do. Okay, so you can either change and become like them to survive, which I think a lot of them do. So you become narcissistic. Or, like me, you become very helpful. It sort of brings out your, your empathic traits more. It highlights your empathic traits more. So I have to remind them that the system is not going to change for a long time. So uh, even mentorship goes in that in that vein sometimes where it's like, and I had a mentee recently say, you know what, I'm okay now. Can you move on to some other topic? Because then I said, have you come out of survival mode? And she said, yes. Like she's got the skills now. She can navigate. The system is still bad. And she did a post about it, um, I think earlier this week, about microaggressions and all of that. But but she has the tools now. So I think the system is sick. I think as, as are most of these sort of so-called prestigious careers, like medicine and, you know, where you are in the forefront, people are looking to you for answers. You have, literally, you have this costume to wear every day and you're sort of changing the world and you have all this influence over people because you have a title. And so I think that it just attracts the wrong crowd. And then it's those people that instead of, of getting well, they perpetuate the, their toxicity. So another thing I have to even tell these CAs is that you can break that cycle. So if you're looking for a mentor in your law firm, why don't you be a mentor to somebody in that law firm, maybe other CAs? 
why don't you guys support each other through what you all are going through? Because you are you guys are your own best friends. You can either be your own best friends or your own worst enemies. But you can support each other. You can, it's going to be a small movement, but you can start to turn the tide. Be that person that you are looking for in your law firm. So it's all of those kinds of getting, I have to get, literally get into the situation with them, which again is empathy. And say, like, this is how, this is how you can, you can not just survive. Firstly, you've got to get out of survival mode. And then this is how you can continue there because you can't always run away. You know, it's not always advisable to run away because these people are everywhere. I mean, narcissists are everywhere. So you can't run away from the situation. Obviously, if it gets to a certain point where it's critical, then you do. But there is a way to navigate it. So I think that's the most tiring part of what I do is just getting them to think, think in a way that not, not puffs them up, but it, it, it makes them see their own autonomy in the situation. Um, and of course... Some of them just need, they'll say, this is happening, this is happening. I get a whole story in the DMs and I'll say, I'll only have one line. To ask. I'll, I'll say, you know what you have to do. And they'll say, yes, I do. I'm going to do it. Sometimes all of them, some of them just need that one line. It's just to tell them they're not crazy. Because I think it's this whole thing of, when you hear seniors berating you, when you hear seniors saying you didn't do this or you did it wrong, you feel every time you are in the wrong, you feel like you are, you can never do anything right. Sometimes they need someone to say, hey, you only know so much. Okay, if they didn't give you guidance, you wouldn't have known that. So don't accept, don't internalize what they've said. If they gave you the guidance and of course you didn't follow the instructions, then take accountability, be mature, stand up, own up. But if they, they didn't tell you, then don't take. And of course, not everything is about you. So they may have gotten a phone call or read a text message before they spoke to you. Not that abuse is justified, but it's, it's, I find it's, it's very, very, very rare that it's, they respond in the moment. They're usually responding from, they're usually being triggered by your words or your action. And they're responding out of something else. So I tell people, first part of call, don't take it personally. Okay, it's probably not about you. And if you see the way generally narcissists, they treat people the same across the board. So it's not about you specifically that they are out to get. You just take the meat, leave the bones, if there's any meat to be had. But just refuse to automatically internalize it and That's of course again advice. and then of course mentorship comes in there as well where someone will tell you from the outside you know you're not crazy or maybe you could have handled it better and here are some points is if that does come up again so there is no silver bullet and the system is what it is but i think teaching them these coping strategies, survival skills, and ultimately empowering them to stand on their own two feet in the face of nasty people. Because um, people are not born nasty. You know, as Mandela said, people aren't born hating. They become that way, you know? And while they, their actions and their words aren't justified, they kind of have to be pitied in a way and you've got to navigate around them because you're not going to be able to escape difficult people in general. Where what what cuts what uh, you know breaks the deal for me is obviously where somebody has to has a breakdown and they go to therapy. Then I'll say, please, articles can wait. Please go and do something else because you can't lose your mental health over a difficult person at the workplace, even your principal, uh, and you know, there's no one that you can talk to. So there are times that are definite deal breakers, but by and large, these people exist all over and you just have to, at the very least, develop your emotional intelligence 
or discover your emotional intelligence and harness that to be able to navigate those situations. Okay, that's amazing advice. Um, I really love how you take something so like negative and actually like turn it into something positive. Like I really, so sometimes when you ask someone a question, they will just like go on and on and on about the problem. But what I really yeah. like about you and your post on LinkedIn is you actually look for how we can solve this, solutions. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Really appreciate it. So for those law firms or those attorneys in law firms who really mm. want to change or who really want to ensure that they are not also like continuing the cycle of bullying, what mm -hmm. advice do you have for them? You know, ultimately, like I say, if you want mentorship, you got to know the kind of practitioner you want to be. And I think too often because it, you know, it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. You'll get that line. And so you just, you can't just follow the crowd and say, okay, that's, that's what a lawyer looks like, or that's what I've been told a lawyer looks like and how they behave and how they talk. So I'm just going to take on that persona. But at the end of the day, you are an individual. And if you are, for you, helping people is important, honesty, um, just being kind, being generous. And if that doesn't fit into the stereotype, to hell with the stereotype. Like, okay, if you are, you, I would, and I always been that kind of person, maybe it's easy for me to say, but I would much rather be alone and authentic in the field, which is pretty much what I'm doing now. What I do is not popular amongst the seniors. So I'd rather be, you rather, you know, it's, it's about choosing to, uh, you either be alone and authentic in what you do and purpose, you know, purposeful, then fit in with the crowd and put on an act. And I think it was one thing I've learned recently about Gen Z is that they can spot a phony a mile away and they will tell you, give me the, give me the stuff, give me the real stuff. Like, I'm tired of, I'm tired of what I've been seeing and it's clearly not working. So what is the actual, what is the truth? So if you want to break the cycle, just be yourself. Like, <laughs> just be generous. If that's the antithesis of being a lawyer, be that. You shouldn't worry about what, look, if belonging in a certain collegial circle is more important to you, then you're not going to break the cycle. Because you've got to be, and you've got to be willing to be unpopular. Um, if you want to do good, I think. Uh, because our profession is not geared towards wellness. It's not geared towards, and among I'll speak amongst our co uh, colleagues. We make a lot of noise about mental health, but we don't look after each other. We don't look after the ones that want to come up. Like I said. So you just have, just be yourself. Lawyer is just one cap that you wear. It's not, it's not the whole of your identity. Like as a narcissistic people, that becomes their shell. So they sort of operate from that. You take that away. They don't have a sense of self. But if you have a strong sense of self and individuality, again, personal branding. That's about personal branding. And I tell, I tell students, I mean, law students, aspiring baby lawyers, as I call them, you know, apart from your CV and the firms that you've worked for, who are you? Right? And a lot of them will take on the identity of the firm. They'll take, they'll take on the branding. They'll take on the firm's reputation, the firm's track record. It becomes their own. And so when they list it on a CV and they're going for an interview, they sort of they're piggybacking off the identity of every firm that they've worked on for. And it's like, but who are you as a lawyer? Who are you as a legal professional? So that's, again, that's where personal branding comes in as a lawyer. And I saw a post this morning about how lawyers should use LinkedIn. It's not about your company page. It's about your individual profile. You have to leverage who you are. 
So if you want to be a cycle breaker, please be yourself. Be different. Don't ignore or put down certain qualities or traits or be ashamed because it's not loyally or not lawyer-like. There is no mold. Okay, if anything, the mold is a caricature. It's a it's comedy, right? Everyone knows lawyers are liars. What if you are a lawyer who's honest and who has integrity? Be that. Okay, like I, I would make a joke when I was much younger to say, I'm gonna I'm gonna prove people wrong and tell the truth as a lawyer. You know, um, so just be, just break the cycle where you are. You don't have to be a huge advocate for change. You don't have to have a special group. Just start where you are, be yourself, be the colleague that maybe you wish you had as a mentor in the legal field. Be that to the juniors in your firm. Just be yourself, be different and be prepared to lose people along the way lose your friends because mm -hmm. I promise you your life is richer it can be lonelier but it, it's much richer for choosing to be yourself who happens to be a lawyer and who has all these talents and abilities and unloyally traits if you just don't want the cycle to continue the bad toxic cycle to continue then don't then jump off the pendulum jump off the hamster wheel and just break the stereotype and I guess become the antidote in a way. Obviously, everyone can start, we can start our own personal, we can start revolutions where we are in our, in our spaces. We all don't have to be part of a movement. Just start it where you are and start being the antidote to the toxicity in the legal profession in South Africa or even internationally. So, Lisa, tell us about all the services that you specifically offer. Okay. Uh, like I said, I have to write it. <laughs> have a list. <laughs> okay, so the main, obviously, one is educational. So it's my academy. It's a first year LinkedIn, which is free. Um, it's my academy, which has my name. When I start things, I just tack my name onto it. It's very ingenious, but I feel very conspicuous about it. So it's it's my name, Lisa Lisa Thomas Legal Academy. And then, so that's the primary, that's the flagship service, I guess you can call it. Um, and I've been working hard on my website and just tweaking things so that my service delivery is better. So that that's the classes for fall under there. Um, the mentorship is another initiative. And although that platform is primarily free, there are those that choose to pay for it. So I welcome that, but I never I never make money the object. So even my academy has like a pro bono facility. If I feel that someone really deserves, really needs the help, I can't pay for it. So there's the mentorship, um, the, the professional mentorship. And then I've had some people reach out to me for coaching. So they I mean they already qualified. They've already been in the field for a while. They need some direction. They need someone to spur them on and give them um, maybe more clarity on next steps that they want to take. So the coaching side has kind of opened up recently. And then I guess the others, you can't call them services. They just, all of my pies, that I've got fingers in. So it's, like I said, that problem solvers mentorship, which is to encourage those that are not litigious beings. Um, and of course, that's to do with my dispute resolution mediation endeavors. So I'm trying to get law students away from the adversarial system. So I've had a few takers for the problem solvers mentorship. Um, then I said I started mediation services uh, for career, career related conflict, especially when it comes to loved ones and things like that, where it's causing problems. Um, so that one's, like I said, it's my one of my newer crazy projects. Then I've got the VVP, the virtual volunteer project, which is now aimed at 
first and second year students simply because I've gotten my fingers burned with all the years. So first, second, third, fourth, and law graduates. So I, for me, the earlier I get them, the better. So right now they're on a break for exams, but it will resume. And that one is just, again, like I said, it's the antithesis of legal or work experience. I teach them soft skills, time management, emotional intelligence, all those lovely things that university doesn't tell us about. So that I've been, I think it's in its second cohort now, which, and I've, that one I want to shut down many times for reasons that I just said now. Because um, when it's time to be taught and to be pushed and for accountability and for teamwork to take place and all those things that I teach them, you experience some pushback. So, but that's that's open um, and that is not paid for. So it's, most of the stuff I do is free. So that BVP thing is something that is another operation of mine. Um, and there I have internal mentorship there as well for the volunteers. It's kind of like a perk of belonging. Then I've got the candidate attorney advocacy group. Um, which I've been trying, like I said, be trying to get off the ground, but that is the uh, sort of an umbrella. I'm trying to get NPO status, but it's not working. So I'm just going to carry on doing what I have to do. Um, God, I mean, the problems are just, it's too loud, especially with the latest board exam results. So um, I'm going to be doing some, I've, I, we've done surveys in the past, I'd engage the problems and it's just there to just be a voice. Because like I said, there's a lot of fear and people just don't want to say anything. So candidates are afraid. Even the juniors are afraid. So the, the candidate attorney advocacy group exists sort of to be that voice. Um, but we're yet to do anything big. And when I say we, I mean I. Because there's no we. <laughs> I feed by myself. So there's the CAG. Um, see, what else have I written here? Okay, that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, the academy, mentorship, and coaching, the VVP, problem solvers, mentorship, career crossroads resolution services, um, virtual volunteer project, candidate attorney advocacy group. And then, of course, there's LinkedIn, which is the easiest the easiest place to find me. Okay. Well, this conversation was really fascinating and I really learned a lot from you. And I think our listeners are also going to learn so much from this discussion specifically. So I just want to thank you for taking the time to be on this podcast and to answer all the questions that I had. You're most welcome. So where can our listeners then reach you? Except for LinkedIn, okay. of course. <laughs> Except for LinkedIn, okay. I'll be honest, LinkedIn is the one that I service the best. So if you DM me there, or if you reach out to me there, I'll see that first. Um. So yeah, it's Lisa Valley, um, V for Vicky, A-L-E-N-E, -E, Thomas. The full name. There, there are lots of Lisa Thomases on LinkedIn. There's nobody with my name. So I'll be the only one that comes up. Um. Yeah, and then I'm on Instagram. Not so active. I'm trying to crack the Instagram space still. But there you can, my handle is lawmomlisa, L-A-W-M-O-M-L-I-S-A, all lowercase. YouTube, oh yeah, my YouTube channel is my late, is one of my latest projects as well. So if you want to head over to YouTube and again, Law Mom Lisa, type that, that, type that in. I'm building that up now. Um, that's another project of mine trying to get myself in that space and yeah and then of course my email address that's on my LinkedIn profile is lisa the loma at gmail.com thank you for listening to this episode of the justice in hills podcast if you enjoyed this episode feel free to share it with your friends on social media and tag us as this podcast has a legal element just a quick disclaimer that all views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of the firms, companies or brands that we are associated with. 
until next time goodbye